Okay. All right. Uh, I'm pretty nearly finished with uh, Leisure World, and that'll be the end of me. So, uh, in uh, in June, uh, my uh, nephew, who lives here in uh, Oklahoma City, he's uh, with Inexco Oil, Clark Baker, um, decided that he couldn't handle his mother's business affairs over the long distance telephone, nor could he be running back and forth of flying every weekend. So he just made up his mind that the, the two of us would have to sell our apartments and, and move down here. So here we are. So that's it. Now, uh, now for you. Mm -hmm. After World War One, what did you actually do with the soldiers? In in what? How did you set up the occupational therapy <coughs> program? Well, I didn't set up the occupational therapy. Um, I, I I told you that uh, I had the course at Reed College under Dr. Beach and Miss Mary McMillan. Now, Miss Mary McMillan was um, the physiotherapist for Sir Robert Jones in London, uh, early, early long in the war. And Sir Robert Jones loaned her to Reed College to uh, set up the program with Dr. Beach. So we set up the, er, they set up the programs and uh, the curricula uh, that we were to take during, during that time. And every school, I, that Mr. Todd, I told you yesterday that Boston had a school and it began with P, it's Posse, P-O-S-S-E-E, Posse. I thought of it during the night. I woke up and and uh, 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 the Posse School of uh, Physical Therapy. Well, anyway, every when you come into a hospital or when you come into a school or uh, anything, every every department has its own setup, and they set up their own situation. <coughs> but every one of them who do the setting up, say for instance, um, like coming in here for instance. When, when I came here, I found a young woman who was artistic, but she'd had no occupational therapy, she'd had no physical therapy, she'd had no training in anatomy or kinesiology or anything. She didn't know what of these things that she was doing, handwork or a bicycle trip, one went there. She didn't know what was helping, and she wasn't working with a doctor. And that is what every occupational therapist and every physiotherapist has to do, is to work under a doctor's supervision in the hospital or uh, a workshop. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. This is mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, now, in the hospital in Boston. In Boston? Yeah. Yeah. You said that you arrived there and the hospital was empty. No, no. Uh, oh, the hospital in Boston. That was U.S. General Number 10, which was an Army hospital. Yes, and they we. All the soldiers in. Yes, and what that was the that was an army hospital. All right, and uh, uh, was 600, 600 soldiers. So we had both physio and occupational therapy departments there, and each one of those departments was under a trained supervisor with trained therapists in both both instances, 
some one of us had been at Reed or Battle Creek or Posse or UCLA uh, or had some special training uh, for it. So uh, we worked under each one had a trained physiotherapist and a trained occupational therapist as a supervisor. And then we all worked under an army doctor. An army doctor was in charge of both departments, and he was the one that set up the rules and regulations well, for us. Well, with now with me for uh, occupational therapy, for instance, we were working with uh, every kind of uh, art craft that uh, we were trained in, uh, physiotherapy. I worked with them, uh, and but shrapnel, uh, boys who had shrapnel wounds in their hands and their fingers were like this. We couldn't straighten them out. All right. I worked with them on the typewriter with, with that. So, but with the stretching exercises and, and all that, that sort of thing. The other girls were working with them with reed, with raffia, with every sort of thing that would stretch and pull and, and give uh, the exercise that was needed. The physiotherapists actually did the pulling and the stretching and the stretch and the pulling and the uh, work, the exercise work and every, everything with them. But we worked together, both the physiotherapists and the occupational therapist. Are you an occupational therapist? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm both because I had the physiotherapy training in Reed and I had the occupational therapy training at the St. Louis School of Occupational Therapy. So I had both. Besides working with the men on the typewriter, what else did you do? Oh, what kind of other, kind of other, other things you, uh, you were working with. Uh, tubs of hot and cold water. Uh, we had them every so often. You had to come in with wax. Um, I, re I remember one, one boy couldn't, couldn't close his fingers at all. And so, so what we did was to take one of those big pencils, like uh, one of those big black pencils, you know, and build it up with gutta percha so that whenever he took a hold of that and he had to squeeze the gutta percha because it was soft in order to get the exercise with that. So that's just one thing. We did carpentry. We did wallpapering. We did everything, anything that we thought uh, would help uh, uh, or give a man an interest. We had a number of artists, boys who uh, could draw or who had had uh, good artwork, one thing or another, and we ran a little shop right in the hospital to sell what they had. Uh, we had a boy who was a silversmith. Beautiful, beautiful silverwork, bracelet rings, it just everything. And we had an outlet for him uh, with that. So, and we had ceramics was another thing that we started with. Oh, uh, okay, we, we poured, we poured the, the slip, we fixed the slip, you know, and the uh, and every, we let everybody get in and fiddle around with it to uh, soften up their fingers. All right, and we let them pour the slip. We let them pour it into the molds and uh, all that sort of thing. So just anything and everything that we could use in uh, occupational therapy, Mr. Todd, 
we used everything. And right now, of course, I haven't kept up uh, with it for quite some time, but right now, there's so many more things that they're doing uh, than we have uh, facilities for or materials for. But the, I, I will say for the Army that they never stinted us on one thing that we needed in uh, equipment with that. Everything like a whirlpool bath? Or? Yeah, yeah, the physiotherapy had a whirlpool bath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With uh, that. Oh, and they had all kinds of stretching exercises. They had a regular gymnasium. Was this the first uh, project like this in the U.S.? Mm, no. Um, Sir Robert Jones. In, in London that I spoke of, uh, had a clinic in which uh, he had uh, a lot of this sort of thing. And Miss Mary McMillan worked with him uh, in that clinic. So it, it wasn't the first, by, but it was the first in the United States. Okay, well, it wasn't yeah, the, the, the Army. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about Armistice Day? Oh, what do I remember? Well, what did you do that day? Let's see, what did I do that day? Well, let's see. Let me think of. Let me think of nineteen eleven. Let's see. Yeah. I was all packed and ready for New York. And I remember a, a, a very good friend, a man, asking me uh, to go to dinner with him that night at the hotel. And this was in Minnesota now, because I had come back, you see, from Portland home. And uh, uh, so I said, fine, fine, dinner, all right. So, so, and of course, dancing came along with that. But oh, Mr. Todd, the weather. I can remember the weather so well. It had snowed and um, melted a little bit uh, prior to that, till it was slush. <laughs> there was slush a foot deep everywhere. And it was cold. What and it was cold in New York, too. What kind of Minnesota was this? Uh, uh, what? What kind of, were you in Minnesota? Yes. What, in St. Paul? No, it was 210 miles north of St. Paul, up, up, in the, up in the lake region. Up in the lake region uh, with that. At Detroit Lakes, that's where it was. Somebody interfering here? <coughs> yeah, that's where, of course, it was regular winter weather for Minnesota at that time. And it was winter weather for New York, too. Oh, New York had a foot of snow when we landed there the next day or so. Was there much celebration? Yes, yes, just a, a terrific lot. In, in this little town of 6,000, where, where I was born and raised, uh, everybody was just hilarious, and there were drinks and every, everything, everybody. And uh, all those were quieted down when we got into New York a little bit. Anything after the World's Fair, St. Louis World's Fair of 1904? No, no, that, that was too far ahead of us. 
1904. But uh, at, at that time, um, I didn't have anything to do with occupational therapy or Washington University, except that uh, the World Fair grounds uh, were still part of it was intact. And part of it was um, uh, Washington University campus, uh, the end of, uh, of the, what did they call it? Not the mall, but the, uh, something, the end of, uh, of the um, World's Fair uh, grounds, anyway. Uh, Washington University was built then at, at the end. If you know anything about Washington University, it, you know that it's a very fine school and a progressive. Uh, someone told me that the administration building of Washington University was the administration building for the fair. I think it was. I, I'm, I'm, now that you mention it, I'm sure it was. And it, it was, um, well, let's see, it was terraced. Uh, from the end of the World's Fair section. And um, the, the administration building was on the first, first terrace. Then the, the uh, university was built back up and to the sides. Uh, Were any of the big buildings, the World's Fair left in the 30s and anything? Oh, well, uh, let's see. They left the um, museum, the they left the museum, and they left, um, they left, um, let's see, another big building on top of the hill. Yes, they were big buildings and uh, well used and well taken care of, and uh, are still uh, being used as, as uh, for the same thing in St. Louis. Uh, the museum down on, um, on Lindell Boulevard, which is the other end of Washington University, is a beautiful, beautiful building, and they have a splendid collection there. Mm -hmm. um, how was Saint, what was St. Louis like during the Depression? Do you think? Sorry. Sorry just like Oklahoma City is today, almost. It's, uh, it, was, uh, it was depressed, and uh, the people were, oh, what shall I say? Uh, the people were hard put uh, to do things and get things, and, uh, Every, everybody was striving the best way they knew how. Uh, and no money. Heavens, uh, a dollar an hour, a dollar and a half an hour was, was uh, much at that time, much at that time. But I don't know, somehow or other, well, and of course, you know, maybe you do and maybe you don't. St. Louis is built on a riverbank, on a, on a riverbank. And as you, as you come up, you get slums. All along the riverbank was a slum section. And that was the Hooverville um, part of, of St. Louis was built on. And it was pretty awful. Pretty awful. Well, uh, while I was doing casework for the state, uh, several of us were loaned uh, for the food things and uh, the distribution of clothing and that sort of thing. So I did see uh, some of that and, and knew it for what it was. Men, I used to feel so sorry for the men as well as for the women, but for the men, because it was so hard for them to ask 
the thing. They needed sheets, or they needed bedding, or they needed food. It was hard to find a house. Was Hooverville on the river? Huh? Was Hooverville? Hooverville on the river? No. No, it wasn't on the river. It was, uh, oh, again, like, like this. But there like were... The terraced area? Yeah, yeah. Terraced area, yes, uh, but um, streets, uh, certain streets that were um, uh, slums, uh, lightly clean, and uh, there in certain neighborhoods. And the nearer you came to the river, the worse it got. But as you came out west, Toward the, uh, the west, uh, things were a little bit better, but uh, uh, rundown and needing repair and all that kind of thing. Oh, uh, St. Louis really has a history, a history. Have you been to the art? Have you been to the big arts in St. Louis? Oh yes. Well, well, what I want to ask you is, when you get this thing edited, uh, written up, would you let me edit it? Sure. My part of it? Sure. All right. I'd, I'd like to see it. Okay. With that. To. All right. Okay. I'd, I'd like to edit it, if you, will, if you will. But I hope I haven't done all the talking now when you should have been doing the talking. No, no. I came to hear you talk, not hear me talk. <laughs> well... I don't know. Uh, my life seems to have been uh, a life of errors. Teaching and army and uh, uh, occupational therapy and physiotherapy and then uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield and then uh, Leisure World uh, at all. So I don't know. It's, yeah, oh, sure. Where were you when the Titanic went down? Oh, what date was that? It was 1912. 1912. I graduated from high school. That, Minnesota? That year. Uh huh. So that was in April, I think. April, April of 1912. Okay. Oh, I, I didn't graduate. I graduated from the high school in the 11th and in, in 12 with my first year of teaching. My first year of teaching. That's, that's where I was. was in Minnesota. Okay. So I remember the Titanic. What was your first thought when you heard about it? Was it back on the front line? Well, of course, being only 17 or 18, uh, it, it really didn't mean too much other than it was a lot of people that uh, had been lost, but um, uh, horrible to think about. Just horrible to think about. When did you go to Washington University? Mr. Todd, you'd be surprised if I told you. Uh, all these years, and from the time I had left Moorhead State and Red College, I had been doing, picking what I wanted from this university and that school and one school. And when I got to St. Louis, here was Washington University, St. Louis University, Harris Teachers College, uh, the School of Occupational Therapy. There were plenty of places to to pick and choose what you wanted. So in, in all those years, uh, those years in the Army, I didn't do much then. But after I got to Washington, uh, to uh, St. Louis, and had the chance to, to take the things, I just picked and chose what I wanted. And uh, Washington University and St. Louis University were uh, available. And so I took them. And uh, uh, I built up enough 
credits to do a whole, uh, to do my uh, degree work, except for the fact that Washington University demands uh, that you live a year on campus. Was or St. Louis University doesn't demand that. But Father Schutz, yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Father Schutzalo was the head of St. Louis University and uh, one thing or another. So, so I did my year's work uh, on the campus. And at the time, that was in 34, 33 and 34, um, Mr. DeBaton told me, he said, Miss Van Camp, mm -hmm. do you know something? You're the oldest person on the campus. I said, well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised, Mr. DeBaton. I'm, I'm almost 40 years old. He said, don't tell anybody and let the kids find out for themselves. So uh, I, when I took my degree, I was 40 years old. So, but it, Mr. Todd, it was something I wanted. I wanted that degree more than anything else I, I, that I know of. And I was just bound, determined I was going to have it regardless. And so, and that's been the way it's been, everything. Everything that I wanted, I wanted and wanted hard and worked hard for. Well, that being that, okay, so we can't keep you any longer.